How many of y'all know we have to celebrate our victories? Amen. So to celebrate our victories that we that we had last week. If you weren't here last week, we had a great blessing last week. Um, Brother Brandon was was healed, was delivered, was everything you can imagine. He he God preached the sermon last week. Amen. So to um, celebrate this victory, I'm going to ask Sister Ellen and Brother Brandon to come up here and just give a, a little testimony here for us. Y'all give them a big round of applause. They have been faithful to what God has done for them. Yes, as Judy just said, we have to get back to the cross. We have to give, give up. We sing that song, I Surrender All. Do we really do that? I was talking to Judy, and she said, oh, I would give it anything to be able to see. I said, would you truly give up any everything? I gave up things that I thought I needed in my life. I said, I don't need this. It's not good for me. And I have to ask church that you forgive me because I had sin in my life, and Somebody said, oh, well, you can, you can sin. All you got to do is repent afterwards. And then I said that Wednesday night, and Pastor Josh said something, and that really resonated in my heart. 
that no, no we can't we just go, go on, on sinning, sinning and sinning and sinning and, sinning and, sinning and, sinning and say, oh, well, we have an advocate with the Father. No, he says sin, not. And we have to truly turn our lives over to God. We all say we want revival. Do we really want it? revival and we have to we have to give up what we what we truly hold on to and the thing that i'm holding on to right now is my god and my savior for he is my god my savior and he's my lord and he is a god that healeth and brother bill i want to lay hands on you because i feel that the lord he's no respecter of persons and he healed brandon and he can heal you and he can make you better y'all give the lord a hand clap there Amen. Amen. Guys, I, I, I've been a part of services like that, like we had last Sunday. And uh, to be counted as, um, to be counted as holy enough to be a part of a service like that and pray over somebody and feel something leave a child of God and be able to lead them into a sinner's prayer once again. I told you, church, when I first got here that we were going to grow. It wasn't always going to be numerically, but it was going to be spiritually, and we grew spiritually last week. And I have been riding that high just as Sister Ellen has, and I hope everybody has in here this morning. Um, one more thing before we get into our praise and worship here. Um, as you all know, a couple of months back, uh, three months back probably, we started doing some um, superhero volunteer announcements, and um, we didn't want anybody to think we forgot August. I know it's the, towards the last of August, but uh, um, our superhero volunteer this week or this month um, is somebody who has been on vacation, but at the same time doing work for the church. And I can imagine giving up some of your vacation time, some of your time with your grandkids, your kids, to still keep doing work for the church. So, Miss Terry, um, you are a, our superhero volunteer. Um, at your normal seat, you have a, a gift. Miss <laughs> um, Terry is Miss Terry is giving up time this morning to make sure everything's going smoothly in the back too, along with taking care of kids and and making sure. Um, Make sure checks are getting out to people that need it. <laughs> I mean, every a little bit of everything this morning already. So uh, thank you again, Miss Terry, for all the work you've done and all you keep doing. Um, but this time, guys, let's just stand up and let's go to the the throne room of God with thanksgiving and praise. Amen. Let's stand up together. Heavenly Father God, we thank you once again for being a part of our service, Lord. We thank you right now, Father God, for inhabiting our praise this morning. God, we're going to praise you, Lord, with a smile on our face and with sincere hearts, Lord. It's in our blessing, holy name we do pray. Amen and amen. Let's shout it out that we're free this morning, church. Yeah. God, we praise you right now, Father God. We thank you, Father God. We thank you right now for inhabiting every part of our praise, Father God. We thank you for helping us through this, Father God. Lord, you are worthy of it all, Father God. You have done so much. You have set us free, Father God. You have allowed us, allowed us to see graves turned into gardens, Father God. You're the only one who can allow us to see these things, Lord, through your eyes, Father God. God, I praise you right now, Father God, for what you've done in this house already, Father, and what you're going to continue to do, Father. God, you have, you have touched us, Father. You have blessed us, Father God. And I thank you right now for continuing to bless us and touch us, Lord. Lord, it's in thy blessing, holy name, that we all do say amen and amen. Praise God. All right, this time I am going to ask my ushers to come forth. Amen. Y'all can be um, seated if you would like. Our song during the offering this week is going to be a little bit different. Amen. 
And we're going to allow y'all just to sit back and relax and enjoy. And y'all can sing along with us if you want to. We're going to be singing a little part of the chorus of Oh Happy Day because we have had some happy days this week. Amen. Amen. All right. Brother Brandon, will you lead us in prayer? Happy day. Oh, happy day. Amen. That's almost as good as this little lot of mine, isn't it? <laughs> Amen. Y'all give it up for the praise band one more time, guys. A lot of hard work goes into everything they do. Amen. Yeah. I'm going to tell you what. They, it, we've, had, we've had some mishaps this morning already, church. I'll go ahead and tell you, but we got, we got through it. Amen. I do want to thank all these guys up here because this morning we had cords cut. We had uh, a pedal break. Uh, we're missing a bass player. Uh, he's, you know, any of y'all are musicians or in, in bands or know anything, but the bass and the drum is kind of like the backbone. And if you don't have but half your backbone, it's hard to, get, hard to motivate, right? But anyway, God's always got it. He's always happy to hear us. He loves hearing from us. And uh, he loves hearing from you guys. And I love it when we start some little new thing. And I get to see those big smiles on everybody's faces. And we know we're doing something for God. And that's all that matters. Amen. Sister Jill, did you have something you wanted to say, ma'am? Okay. I just, you could be seated then. Okay. You were. Yep. Oh. You were standing for the next song, Will. Oh, uh, we'll, have to, we'll have to come back to that one. Yes, uh, praise the Lord. Um, no. <laughs> yeah, done got the praise and worship leader started now. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, yes, praise. Um, at this time, before we uh, turn it over to our guest speaker here and his wife, um, our guest speakers, I should say, is what I want to say at this point. I'm going to put her on the spot, too. I don't know if she has anything to say, but she's going to say something today. Um, that's what happens when you meet at camp, right? <laughs> no, but um, this morning, um, as Sister Ellen said, we do want to um, pray for um, Brother Bill. And Brother Bill has been here through thick and thin. Um, I, he, is, he is a man who stood up for our denomination. He has um, worked hard in our denomination throughout all the years. Um, I, uh, yeah, y'all give him a hand clap. Just a, just a little side note for Aaron and Brittany. You know, y'all were, we were talking about before church about the drive from here to Dunn. He did that every day <laughs> when he worked for Dunn. So, um, but he has done so much for this church. And, um, Yes, yes, he is. And so um, we just want to take a little bit of time, pray over him. Um, yes, he is, he's been there from the get-go of the nomination, I feel like it. Um, but I'm going to come up here, and I'm going to anoint him. I'm going to ask everybody just to, if you're close to him, you can reach out to him. If you're not close to him, just stretch your hands out real quick for us um, as we take, take this time to pray for him because he is definitely in a special need. And... Uh, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We got you, brother. You got your brothers and sisters right here with you. Amen. Father God, Lord, he loves being a church. 
serve you, Father God. I pray right now that he can come to church every single time, Father God. Lord, every single time he wakes up with a smile on his face, Father God, let it be the smile of you, Father God. For I know he loves you, Father God. He shines the light, Father God. Wherever he goes, he shines a light for you, Lord. So God, I just ask you right now, Lord, you continue touching his life, Father God. And Lord, and let it be a light that just shines and touches us, Father God. We praise you, Father God, for what you've done, Father God. Touch his body, Father God. He needs this touch, Father God. And we agree together. Lord, all of us agree together, Lord, and receive it together, Father God, of his healing touch, Father. Lord, it's in our blessed and holy name, Father God. Oh, Father, you are praised right now, Father God. We thank you, Father God, for this man and what he needs in our lives, Father God. Lord, we count it a blessing, Father God, to pray with him and pray for him, Lord. It's in our blessed and holy name, Father God. We praise you, Father God, right now, Lord. Amen. Amen. We praise you, Father We praise you, Father God. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. And you go through the rest of this week, don't forget to pray for Afghanistan. Don't forget to pray for this country. Don't forget to pray for Haiti. Um, pray for people in Louisiana. They're about to get hit by a nice big hurricane. Um, in church, I'll say this, and I've said it many times. Um, Pray for our church plants. These, these people are uprooting everything, uprooting everything to start a church, and many of them don't have any connections when they move there. Um, you know, uh, many people look at, look at me and Kelly and my family and say, you're one of a kind. And I say, no, I'm not one of a kind. I came to a church that was established. I had, I had everything pretty much lined up for me. I knew I was going to preach on Sunday. And I say that because I put people like Aaron and Brittany and their family as one of a kind. I'm just like every other pastor. They're one of a kind people. I'm going to talk them up. And I will look, even after, even after this day, I will still be talking about them because they're part of the family now. And they're not all the way down in North Carolina anymore. <laughs> they were at the southern end of North Carolina at that. I mean, they couldn't figure out if they wanted to live in South Carolina or North Carolina. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. I better stop before I get in trouble. But, uh, <laughs> but um, at this time, I'm going to ask Aaron and uh, Brittany to come on forth. Come on up here, guys. And y'all give them a big round of applause as they come up here to share so much. Um, Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. How are we doing? Great. Great. Fantastic. Fantastic. We are um, honored to be able to be here this morning uh, to worship together with you. Um, we've had the privilege over the last um, almost a year now, about 10, 11 months, to, to travel um, after we left our previous home church in North Carolina to, to travel around and, and worship together with other congregations that we've known of and friends that we have and, and um, just be with different parts of the body of Christ. But this, the thing that is so amazing is that no matter where we go, we see people that love Jesus. We see the hands and the feet of God being carried out and his work carried out in all of the different places that we go. And so it's, it's really easy sometimes to think that, that we are just here, that things are are. are so much against us that the church almost feels like they're losing and we're not we're not the the enemy wins by dividing but we are united in him all the different congregations all the different parts of the body we are united together and so we just thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning to to, to speak to you to to talk with each other um, and worship together so we're, we're excited um, I'm gonna let I'm going to let my wife, my wonderful, amazing wife, um, Brittany, 
to uh, just say a few words. Um, I know I've got a message this morning, but I'm going to let her say just a, a few things this morning, which she had no clue that she was doing. But That's okay. That's okay. You, you give a woman a mic, a woman who, you give a woman who loves Jesus a mic, and um, they got plenty to say. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Um, but like Aaron said, and I'm sorry, I'm a lot louder than Aaron, so I apologize in advance. But um, I, um, we, like he said, we are so happy and excited to be here. Um, we, we got to know Pastor Josh. I got to know Pastor Josh um, because we served at Crusader Youth Camp together. And um, we were redheads, man. Like, we had to stick together. Like... <laughs> And, um, and so through that, he met my husband, Aaron, and I met um, his beautiful wife. And so from there, it was just kind of a, a connection. Um, I call them kingdom connections. You know, you just, you meet people and you just have kindred spirits and you know, okay, God's brought this together for some reason. And um, little did we know that they were coming to Chesapeake. Um, because we had really not shared that we were coming to Virginia yet. And so then I see that he comes to Chesapeake and I'm like, hey, we're going to be Virginia neighbors. Um, and so from there, God just kind of solidified that relationship. And um, I'm, I love how he does that. I love how he just orchestrates every millisecond, even the things that you can't see. He, he orchestrates all of it. And, and so the things, you know, when you can't see that he's working, don't worry, he is. He's working in the, in the heavenlies. He's working in the invisible um, things that we, we don't know about yet. And um, I, I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful for the opportunity and the privilege that we are getting. Like Aaron said, we have had such an encouraging season to be able to, um, right before you know we step out and <laughs> do something that seems crazy and impossible, um, but with, with God, nothing is impossible. I'm having to learn to say that. Um, but, but in this season that we've had of just being able to be with the church, not a church, to be with the church, to be with the body, um, and just to see how every single church, every single house is, is touching something or someone in their community and in their city. And it is the most encouraging thing. And so we come, if nothing else, to tell you the church is on the move. The church is on the move. Don't be discouraged by what you hear. Do not think anything about the lies that people tell you. God is on the move through his church and through his hands and feet. And I am so thankful to be a part of um, this time. I know everybody's like, there's so much uncertainty and fear and anxiety. And yes, there is. But there is also so much hope and miraculous and wonder and signs and greatness and salvation and deliverance. There is so much that God is doing in the midst of this. And so stand firm, church. Stand firm. We're thankful to be here. Amen. Perhaps she should have spoken today. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, but, uh, but we are um, honored and thankful for this opportunity. So I want to thank your pastors uh, for the ability to, to stand here before you today. It's, it's not a simple thing to just hand over the pulpit to someone. So I'm very grateful. I will honor it. Um, but you are one of a kind as well. You guys are as well. And I'm sure everybody around you here feels that as well. So. But we're very thankful. Um, so my wife and I pastor uh, 316 Center, and I know we are in the middle of planting it, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, in Richmond, so not too far away, simple enough to get up this morning and, and head this way. So, um, But we're not alone in it. We do have our three wonderful children, and I believe I have a, a picture up there. They couldn't be with us this morning, but I like to take them with us everywhere we go. So. Um, and this was Mother's Day. She's here in person, that's amazing, but I just want to put her up there again. Um, Nathan is our oldest, and then we have Elena, and then Ezra, who's two, and they just, I don't know, even when they're not with us, just looking at their smiles, it's amazing. 
Um, so we are all in this together, all five of us, and then um, we are all redheads as well, which is pretty cool. Um, but just a little bit of our backstory. Um, is there any way we can turn this down just a little bit? Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, both my wife and I have had the privilege of serving in, in multiple roles and positions in ministry over um, the past, uh, well, really our, our whole entire lives. We both grew up in church. Her, her family were pastors. Her uh, grandfather was pastor. Um, my parents were always involved in ministry, so we were church kids. You know, we, we laid underneath the pews and, and played with cars and toys and all those things. And whenever we were old enough, we took part in ministry and found our place. Thank you very much. And um, so as we continued to, to progress and get older, we, we found different ministries. And so we've served in, in worship. We've served in, in children's ministry. We've served in youth ministry. We've served in... Um, different, different ministries of outreach and, and working with homeless population and things like that. And so we're very privileged to have had that opportunity. Um, and where we were before this um, was, was Bridge of Life, which was in Leland, North Carolina. And if, if you're not too familiar with it, we were about 50 minutes from the South Carolina border. Um, so we're about four, a little over four hours away from, from where we are now in Richmond. Um, but in our story of where we are today, which is what I wanted to share a little bit about um, bef right before this message, just to let you know what we're doing now. Um, it was December of 2016, as, as we, we led worship um, previously, um, we would have practice on Monday nights with the whole team. And then we got to a point of, of just this hunger and this desire to know more of God. And so we would finish our practice at seven to nine to be respectful of time, we would finish practice. And then we got to the point where we just said, hey, if anyone would like to stay after practice is over and just have a time of worship or a time of prayer, there's no structure to it. We're just gonna play. We're gonna come up with, with songs that, that are just on our heart. We're gonna just have a time of, of open prayer and worship. And so, so we would have you know, one or two people. And then as we kept going, we would have you know, four or five. And then it got to the point where whenever we would end practice and just, I would just play for just a minute and look around, you know, that was the time people could leave. And then the whole entire team was still there because everyone still wanted to worship. Everyone still wanted to go deeper. And so it was in one of those moments after one of those practices that I just went over to the side and I had my time of prayer. And the Lord just spoke to me in the way that he often does uh, to many of us and I just began to, to see this vision. And it was like the Bible played out as a video in fast motion from Genesis all the way to the ascension of Jesus in like just a couple seconds. And it's like all of that flashed before my eyes. And I heard God speak to me and he's, right whenever he ascended, right before that, he gave the commission to his disciples go and make disciples. Jesus knew that at that point he was leaving and he gave the charge to those who were gonna follow him. And so I saw that and right at that moment, I felt God saying to me, it's your turn. I've called you to go. Where I left off, that is the same command, that is the same commission that I have given to you. And I want you to go and to preach my word. And so I was just, okay, what does that look like? And so for the next year, we, we began to pray and fast and, and just ask God, you know, seek him. What does this look like, God? Like we hear, we accept what you're calling us to, but what does it look like? And after about a year of just praying with, with, with seems like no, no direction in that, we heard one night, Richmond, and that was all. Nothing more, we just heard Richmond. And so at that point, okay, Richmond. Is that Richmond, Virginia? Is that, uh, you know, so, somewhere else? Does that mean something? And so, okay, for the next little bit, okay, God, we hear Richmond and we, we feel like it's Virginia. 
but we have no connections there. We have no friends there. We have no family there. We don't know anybody there. And so we just begin to pray over that. God, okay, we hear this. Now you're going to need to show us a little bit more. You know, we always do that. He'll give us some. And then it's like, okay, God, um, okay, just a little bit more. What's, what's next? What's the next step? And so we, we, we just prayed and fasted on that word now of Richmond. That was the direction, but we didn't know how to get there. We didn't know what we were supposed to do yet. And so fast forward to February of 2020. We felt like at that time God had began to, to give us more vision and more understanding. And then in March, we felt like God called us at that moment and said, now's your time. Get ready because you're leaving. And so this whole four year journey, which really now ended up being about five years from the initial point of him saying, okay, this is what I want you to do, of just praying and seeking him to now of June of this year, 21, when we actually were able to make the move to Richmond just seeking after God that five years for what his purpose was in our lives. And so we're thankful to have been able to move um, this year. And so we um, are now in Richmond um, from Leland, North Carolina, just south of Wilmington. Um, and we are actively planting 316 Center. And if you are unfamiliar with what planting a church is, um, just visualize a church so think of this one, think of, you know, you've got speakers, you've got seats, some equipment, people. We don't have any of that. That's what planting a church is. <laughs> There's nothing there, but God calls us just as you were planting a seed into the ground where there is nothing there to plow the dirt to plow the earth, to get away the stubble, get away the roots, get away the rocks, to put the seed into the ground, and then through his blessing, he waters it, and then it grows. And so that's what he's called us to do. There's nothing currently in, in Richmond that we are, are going to or, or, or taking over. Um, he's called us to start a new ministry, a new church there, and so we're excited about that, and excited that he would call us to do that. And so we're thankful that we're able to... Um, to be here today and just share a little bit of our heart. Um, and so what, what we're doing today and what we're focusing on, we have a, a launch plan to, to actually hold regular uh, gatherings for Easter of next year. So please be in prayer with us for that. Um, we're, we're in the phase of just actively trying to build relationships within the community. Um, we're thankful um, that already in the past two and a half months, we've got two families that are, that are on board with us and, and beside us that, that we have met since moving there. Um, we're excited about that. Um, we, we've seen already um, fear be overcome in the lives of one family that um, were out of church for the longest time, um, several, several years just because of fear. And then COVID and all of that, that just amplified all of that. And we've seen since then and, and through talking with them, them overcome fear. And we actually attended church with them for the first time in several years. This past Sunday, we were able to, to go with church with them. And, and it was just refreshing to see them and, and then talk with them afterwards. And so we're seeing God, even, even in the smallness of where we are and what we can do right now, we're seeing God's faithfulness. And so we're very thankful for that. We're building um, home churches, and that's how we're going to start meeting before we launch. So we're meeting weekly in our homes um, with just people that, that are interested or anybody who, who will come in so we can just share the word, so, but, so we can build relationships with them. Because people will hear what you have to say whenever they know that you care about who they are. And so we're building those relationships now and allowing people into our home and going over to other people's homes and show them, you know, it's not one way, but love goes both ways. And so that's what we're doing. We're, we're um, generating outreach missions. We're able to, to um, already provide 200 meals a month for homeless and, and uh, uh, food. Um, I think it's in, inefficient 
families where the, there's not enough food that's provided. So we're, we're able to do that and partner with them. And we have a goal of a thousand meals a month, but not just to provide it, but actually to go and to work and to hand it out, to prepare it. And so we're thankful for those opportunities. Um, and also, uh, we've had the ability to create some partnerships already with other local churches because we're all in this together. It's all about the unified body of Christ. And so we've got several churches that we've been attending and meeting with, and, and we've got meetings set up with, with different pastors. I have a lunch on Tuesday with another pastor, and we're going to partner together. And we're joining an organization that is 80, over 80-plus 80 churches in just the Richmond area alone where they're pledging to, to work together. They're different denominations, but they're all putting those differences aside and coming together as the body of Christ to work for change for Jesus. Because no matter what's going on, we all agree on one thing, that Jesus is the only way. And that Jesus is the only answer to any of the issues that we face today. And so we're, we're happy to be able to see that and to be able to be a part of the unity that God is wanting to bring there. And before we, we moved, we knew that we didn't have anything going into this. But we would travel up monthly to just be in the city. We would drive up, you know, it first started during the, during the beginning of the pandemic. Um, we would drive up, no hotels were open. So we would, we would drive up early in the morning. We would stay as long as we could and then drive back late at night just to be in the city, just to see, get familiar, just to, 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 to be with the people there. And so we would do that monthly, at least. And um, we knew going into this planting, we wouldn't have anything. But whenever we would travel up there, God would show us what was there. And it's not what you would think as far as exciting and exhilarating and um, just kind of charging you up to do this, he would show us the brokenness. He would show us the hurt. He would show us the lost. And he would show us the division that is there amongst that people. And it's just gotten worse over the last 18 months. There, here, Everywhere, it seems across the entire world, things are just getting worse. And God just gripped our hearts for the people there, a people who we've never seen before. And just in visiting, in the, the quick trips that we were able to do, he got a hold of our hearts where we knew that as we left Richmond, going back to home, that we were actually leaving home to go back to North Carolina. And one of the biggest issues that I see that makes all of these things worse is that we as people, not you guys, other people, we create lines or barriers in our minds for various reasons or in our lives for various reasons. And just very simply, a, a mental line of what I'm, what I'm talking about or a barrier is something that limits. It's a limiting belief or an assumption that we have about ourselves or something in the world around us in regards to our ability or our potential or the potential of others, self-worth. And it keeps us from doing something or acting on something. It divides. You know, things, things like uh, phrases, you know, my past was this, so I can never be this, or I can never do that, or my parents were this way, so I guess that's just what I'm going to be like. Or how about society gets into the picture, and then you've got lines from society being drawn around you, or being drawn around groups of people saying that, that this is the way you should be, or saying, you know, you're white, so you should be this way, or you're black, so you should be that way. Just these lines of division that are evil. And that's not the way that it's supposed to be. 
Or how about you're a Christian, so you're supposed to wear a mask because you're supposed to care about people. Or you're a Christian, so you shouldn't wear a mask because you should have faith in God that he can take care of you. Lines just being drawn in every aspect of our life. And what does all of this do? Does it bring people closer together? Does it create anything positive? Is it encouraging positive change in our lives or the lives of others? It's not. And when we make these lines, and when we allow society to make these lines, it sets things in stone. And we begin to believe this is just the way that it is. This is the way that it is. This is the way that it's going to be. And there's no way out of it. And we severely limit ourselves to what is possible as Christians. We miss out on the potential of what God has for us and wants us to do in this life. And there have been, been many instances in my own life that I've had to take some time to identify lines that I had made. The lines that I set in place that divided my situation from what was actually true. The lines that put limits on what was possible and the lines that I, to use this analogy again, the lines that I planted in the ground and allowed to sprout up and become barriers to keep me or block me from seeing clearly with vision the things that I was meant to see. But once I identified those lines, once I looked and identified those lines that were just warping my perspective and were stopping me from seeing clean from, from seeing clearly what God said, he said, okay, you see them, now cross them. And it's when we cross over these lines that we're then actually met with knowledge and understanding of what the truth actually is about the situation. So for the next few minutes, um, just, I'd, just probably about three hours, that's all. Um, I'd like to bring out just a little bit of information on crossing the line. Crossing the line. Now, I will say this, and this isn't in the notes, but I was thinking about it. There are some lines that are good. I call those guardrails. They're there on purpose to keep you from doing wrong. The ones that I'm talking about today are the lines that we make that abstract the truth. That's what we're talking about today. So I want to open up the word this morning to 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 18. And I will, I will try to be mindful of time for you this morning. Um, all right, okay, two hours and 45 minutes. There we go. Hey, praise the Lord. He is good. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 18. So, and we're going to start there in 2 Kings, but then we're also going to move quickly after that to Luke 7, um, and then a few others this morning um, before we're through. Uh, I've probably got a, a good amount of scripture this morning, so just, uh, just bear with me. But in my opinion, th there's no better way to preach than allow God's word to do it. Um, so uh, previous to verse 18, which is where we're starting in, in 2 Kings 4, Elisha had built a relationship with a Shunammite woman, which is just a woman from the city or the town of Shunam, and her husband as he would travel around different places and minister. And he would pass by their house on his journey so much that they had built him a small room where he and his servant Gehazi could stay the night and rest in the middle of his travels. And for the hospitality shown and through the conversations of Gehazi and this woman, it was found out that she had no son. And pretty much due to the old age of her husband, in her words, it just wasn't going to happen either. But Elisha prophesied that by the same time next year, she would be holding her baby boy, her only son. And of course, if God says it, it happened. Now fast forward some, times, some time to where we are in verse 18, where the child has grown. In verse 18 it says, The child grew and one day went out to his father and the harvesters. Suddenly he complained to his father, My head, my head! His father told his servant, Carry him to his mother. So he picked him up and took him to his mother. 
The child sat on her lap until noon and then died. Then she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, shut him in and left. She summoned her husband and said, please send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys so I can hurry to the man of God and then come back. But he said, why go to him today? It's not a new moon or a Sabbath. She replied, everything is all right or it is well. Then she saddled the donkey and said to her servant, hurry, don't slow the pace for me unless I tell you. So she set out and went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When the man of God saw her at a distance, he said to his attendant Gehazi, look, there's the Shunammite woman. Run out to meet her and ask, are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your son all right? And she answered him and said, everything's all right. When she came up to the man of God at the mountain, she clung to his feet. Gehazi came to push her away, but the man of God said, leave her alone. She is in severe anguish and the Lord has hidden it from me. He hasn't told me. Then she said, did I ask my Lord for a son? Didn't I say, do not deceive me? So Elisha said to Gehazi, tuck your mantle under your belt. Take my staff with you and go. If you meet anyone, don't stop to greet him. And if a man greets you, don't answer him. Then place my staff on the boy's face. The boy's mother said to Elisha, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So he got up and followed her. Gehazi went ahead of them and placed the staff on the boy's face, but there was no sound or sign of life. So he went back to Elisha and told him, the boy didn't wake up. When Elisha got to the house, he discovered the boy lying dead on his bed still. So he went in, closed the door behind the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. Then he went up and lay on the boy. He put mouth to mouth, eye to eye, hand to hand. And while he bent down over him, the boy's flesh became warm. Elisha got up, went into the house, and paced back and forth. Then he went up and bent down over him again. The boy sneezed seven times, and then he opened his eyes. Elisha called Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite woman. He called her and she came. Then Elisha said, pick up your son. She came, fell at his feet and bowed to the ground. She picked up her son and left. What an amazing thing to see happen. A mother's only son raised from the dead and back to life. Now let's jump to Luke 7, verse 11. And we'll read through 17. Starting at 11, it says, Soon afterward, he was on his way to a town called Nain. His disciples and a large crowd were traveling with him. Just as he neared the gate of the town, a dead man was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. A large crowd from the city was also with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said, Don't cry. Then he came up and touched the open coffin, and the pallbearer stopped. And he said, young man, I tell you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Then fear came over everyone, and they glorified God, saying, a great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report went about him throughout Judea and all the vicinity. So let's pause for just a minute and look back over these two passages of scripture. One in the Old Testament with Elisha. One in the New Testament with Jesus. One that takes place within the law of Moses. And one that takes place with the one who came to fulfill the law, Jesus. One that attempts to stay within the lines or within the confines of what the law says. And one that crosses the lines to reach those who are hurting. One with Elisha, one with Jesus, the old way, the new way. And before going any further, I want us to keep in mind that when sin was introduced into the world by the disobedience of Adam and Eve, a line was drawn by their sin that divided man from God. And from that moment on, people had to initiate and come to God with sacrifices to bridge that gap regularly, to atone for their sins. 
And so we see from then on, man has to come to bridge the gap between man and God, to cross that line through the sacrifices. And in our story in 2 Kings, the Shunammite woman lost her only son, and so she takes it upon herself to initiate a trip to Elisha, to where God was moving. And in our story with Jesus, our new and only way now, we read in, in Luke uh, verse 13 there, when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said, don't cry. And then what we see here is it says, then he came up. So now we see that it is Jesus that now initiates contact with those who are lost. And he goes to the woman first to meet her needs. And I don't know about you, but I'm very thankful that we serve a God that loves us so much that he made the first move now towards us with his son, Jesus. See, there was a, long, a line drawn by sin, a boundary that was created around the way things used to be. But thank God that God breaks every single one of those boundaries that may be there. And so just a couple things, if I could have three points, just three little pieces of information about crossing these lines that I feel if, if we could just think about them would help us in our daily lives is that in our walk with Christ and in our witnessing and in this world, to reach people, we need to be willing to get dirty. And crossing the lines of this world, we need to be willing to get dirty. With Elisha, he gave his staff first to Gehazi with instructions to go and place the staff on the boy's face. It's not detailed here, but in religious law, Elisha knew that he would be unclean by touching the dead body of this boy. Thus, he gave the staff over to avoid contact, to avoid the physical touch. He was under the law that said in Numbers uh, chapter 19, just for reference, it's up there as well, the person who touches any human corpse will be unclean for seven days. He's to purify himself with the water on the third day and the seventh day, then he will be clean. But if he does not purify himself on the third and seventh days, he will not be clean. Anyone who touches a body of a person who has died and does not purify himself defiles the tabernacle of the Lord. That person will be cut off from Israel. Elisha knew this, thus the staff touching, not the physical contact. But with Jesus having compassion on the woman, saying, don't cry, he came up himself. And get this. He touches the open coffin with his hand. Now the coffin that's stated here is not what we are used to today. At that time, it was customary to just have the body wrapped in linen or a cloth placed over the face. So by Jesus touching the open coffin, he is literally touching the body itself. But Jesus knew the religious law. This was a line that was clearly drawn. He didn't mess up by touching this mother's deceased son in the middle of this funeral procession. He knew that he didn't make that trip with his N95 mask that day or with his nitrile gloves or autumn breeze hand sanitizer. He didn't have any of that, but he knew that. He was going to get dirty. He didn't make a mistake by touching this mother's only son. He purposefully crossed that line. But he came to get dirty. But why? Why did he risk himself and his reputation? This man who is a great teacher and prophet in the eyes of so many, why cross a line that everybody knows and willingly become unclean? Why? In verse 13 of Luke, it says, when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. Why did Jesus do it? Why did he make the first move towards her? Why did he initiate contact that would re result in him crossing this line of right and wrong to those around him? Because he had compassion on her. Because he loved her. His heart broke for her. 
He couldn't stand to see her suffering. And as a widow, she had already been through the loss of her husband. That alone causes pain and suffering to the mind, the body, and the soul. The loss of a spouse, I can't imagine. I know perhaps some of you here today or that may see this later if it's recorded, you may have had that experience. You may have gone through the loss of a spouse or a loved one. And it's hard. And it was hard for her too. But as the only son to her, it was his responsibility then and custom to take charge of that household and care for his mother after his father passed. He became the provider. He became the source of income and stability for his mother at that point. She relied on her son at that point more than ever. He was everything now. And then he passes away. Her heart crushed again. Her hope crushed. Her stability shattered. Her family gone. Nothing left. She would be left, most likely, to the people of the community around her for any support and help that she would receive, struggling to provide for herself in that time. And when that happened, she began to draw a line of her own. When her son passed, they were to bury him as soon as possible. There was no reason in her mind not to bury him. He was dead. And there was no coming back from that. From the time the funeral procession began at the house, no doubt, she was probably drawing a long line in her mind with every single step that was uncrossable. It was impossible. He's gone. There's no hope anymore. Perhaps she hadn't heard of this man named Jesus. So why did Jesus reach out his hand crossing all of these lines and touch the body of this woman's son, the pallbearers, seeing what was unfolding, stopped. No doubt in some state of disbelief that someone was actually touching the body. Why would he be doing this? They were probably thinking, this is something that you just don't do. Why would Jesus put himself out there like that? Because he loved her because he had compassion on her. And church, let me tell you this morning that true love crosses lines. As the body of Christ, we can't spend our time drawing lines to keep people out. We should be crossing lines to get people in. Our last part of the passages, not the, not the last part of the message, don't get too happy. I've still got about two hours left. We see that Gehazi, who was sent ahead with Elisha's staff to place on the boy's face, saw that when he did it, the boy didn't wake up. It didn't work. It was only after Elisha prayed and fully relying on his prayer to God and crossing the line of becoming unclean, like what Jesus does in our story in Luke, by placing himself on the boy's body, that he then wakes up. And the Bible says, sneezing seven times and opening his eyes. See, Elisha re relying on his prayer to God for the miracle, and Jesus being God in the flesh, only relying on the power of his own word and speaking to the young man, I tell you, get up. Both, though, willing to get dirty, willing to do what was necessary. Sometimes, people around us might not understand. Sometimes the things God asks us to do can be a little confusing to others, but we've got to be ready to do the things that need to be done. We've got to be willing and ready to get our hands dirty to reach those who need to be reached. And the second thing today, we have to be willing to cross the line for everyone. We have to be willing to cross the line for everyone. Jesus on many occasions crossed lines of social, cultural, economic, political, and religious natures, drawing negative attention from everyone around him, from the Pharisees, from the religious rulers of all the land. 
Jesus ate with all the wrong people. Jesus talked to all of the wrong people. Jesus often did all the wrong things. He routinely upset the religious establishment by loving people that were off limits, for loving people that were across the lines that had been drawn. They were victims of cultural lines drawn around them saying, don't mess with them. They aren't worthy. They're dirty. What Jesus did and who he did it for infuriated the religious people in the day. But Jesus' line-crossing love would have caused great concern for the people around him. Cultural differences and ethnic divides in that area were significant and well-known between Jews and Samaritans. Gender roles in the first century would have made it surprising for Jesus to initiate a conversation with the woman at the well in John 4. And on top of all that, we quickly learn as that story goes on that this woman had some very scandalous sins in her life. She came to the well at noon because it was more bearable to endure the scorn of the sun than to bear the scorn of her shame. She wasn't up for embarrassment that she'd have to endure in a crowd of women from around the community if she went in the cool of the morning with everybody else. It was easier to go when she wouldn't run into anybody. The heat was easier than the whispers behind her back. But when Jesus arrived at this well, he knew all of this and ignored it, damaging. And he ignored it even though it might damage his reputation, even though it might cast shadows upon who people thought he was. He knew all of the cultural, all of the social, all of the ethnic barriers. He knew why she was there. And he even knew the things that she didn't want to talk about. But Jesus still brought it up. John 4, 16, he says, go call your husband, he told her, and come back here. I don't have a husband, she answered. You have correctly said. I don't have a husband, Jesus said, for you've had five husbands. And the man you are now with is not your husband either. What you have said is true. Jesus didn't let any of this change what he offered her. He didn't let the scandal of her sin stop him from crossing the line to offer her life. He didn't revoke his offer of living water once this came out of what she had been doing. In fact, he made this offer before he even asked her these questions, already knowing the behavior that she was hiding. Jesus gave what no one else could give to her. This is what Jesus always does, though. He gets criticized for dining with tax collectors and sinners in Matthew 9 and gets accused of being a drunk and a glutton in Luke 7. Jesus regularly has his own reputation damaged when he crossed lines that other people weren't willing to cross. But Jesus doesn't give himself to the deserving people or to the desirable people. He gives himself to the people who aren't. After being questioned by the Pharisees in Matthew 9, 11, they say, why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? And he said, those who are well don't need a doctor, but the sick do. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. It's God's will out of his perfect, unfailing love in 1 Timothy 2.4 as it states that God, God wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Everyone. And at 316 Center, you can imagine the 316 comes from John 316, which has been so impactful on us, both growing up and now. But the, the part about that verse that's the most intriguing to me as he says, everyone who believes in him will not die, but have life. He doesn't call out just particular people. He doesn't call out just particular social status people, particular groups. 
particular ethnicities. He doesn't call out anybody individually. He calls out everyone collectively. What is his heart? What is his desire? God wants everyone to be saved. And that's our, our vision statement with 316. Everyone matters. Everyone has purpose. Everyone has been called by God. And God desires everyone to know him. You hear all these times, okay, you're starting this church or you, you, you have a church and you're trying to reach people. Who are your target group? What's your target group? Who are you trying to reach? Everyone. I'm trying to reach everyone because God said he wants everyone. So for me to limit and draw a line around what is possible, around who is possible to reach, that I can only reach people like myself, I'm not going to listen to that because I look at his word and what he says and what he tells me is possible, that everyone to be saved is his will. But Jesus Christ, who crossed the ultimate line and gave his life for our sins, could die a thousand times on the cross, and it won't make a single difference if those who follow him do not tell others about him. We've got to cross the lines for everybody. We have to stand up and cross lines that nobody else is willing to cross to reach people that nobody else is able to reach. We've got to cross lines for our family. We've got to cross lines for our friends. We've got to cross lines for our coworkers, for our neighbors. According to what we, we just read in, in Timothy 2.4, God wants everyone to be saved. In 316 of John, everyone who believes in him will be saved. We've got to be willing to cross whatever lines God would have us to cross to reach everyone that God places in our path. So what is holding us back from doing it? And the third one, we've got to cross the lines in our own lives. We need to be willing to get dirty. We need to cross lines for everyone but we need to cross the lines in our own lives. And the biggest part of this particular point is really just presenting us an opportunity today for us to evaluate ourselves. What lines are there that might be surrounding you today? What lines has society just drawn in circles around you? Has culture got you locked down in place? Maybe we just need to spend a little bit of more time in the secret place. What line has been drawn that's keeping you from taking the next step in your walk with God? None of us have arrived. None of us are there. There's always a next step to take. There's always more. God is always working. If you're alive and breathing, God has a plan for you. God has a purpose for you that never stops. Maybe it's a line that you've drawn that you've been unable to cross, that you know, but you've been unable to cross it previously. And it's keeping you from going deeper in your relationship with Christ. Maybe it's fear of what those around you will think if you begin to start cleaning up some things in your life. Maybe it's anxiety over the unknown of what God might ask you to do. Maybe it's the unknown of what God might ask you to give up. Maybe the line that you haven't been able to cross is the line of salvation. Maybe you don't know him. Maybe you're listening today and your next step is to give your life to Christ. And I invite you to take that step today. Cross that line today. See, there's, there's something standing in your way that's blocking your vision. There's a line a barrier that's been drawn somewhere in your past that's still dividing you from the truth. God's already said that it's possible. He's already spoken over you what your life is to be. And that line is blocking you from the potential of what he's called you to do and your ability to turn the world upside down for Jesus. 
See, Jesus crosses every line that stands between you and him. Every line that you've built up to keep sin hidden. Every line that culture or even religion or society has created that makes you feel like you're not good enough. Jesus crosses those lines. He ignores the damage it might cause his reputation. He touches your coffin. And he calls you to get up. Your next step starts with crossing the line. If you need salvation, your next step is here at the altar. That's what it's all about. If you need to cross over fear, your next step leads down to the altar. If you need to overcome sickness or disease, your next step leads down to the altar. If the enemy has drawn lines around your family, your next step is here down at the altar. Pastor, I'm not sure you're regular, but if we could have a moment, I would like to have an opportunity for those who feel like there are some lines in your life today that you would like to cross over, that this altar is open for you, to have a moment to come and seek his face. Whatever you need, he is here. Would you come, whatever that line may be, God says cross it today. Society says that it can't be done. Your past might say that it can't be done. The world says that it can't be done. But don't listen to the voices that say you can't change or you'll never be good for anything. And don't listen to the voice that says your time has passed. you won't be able to make a difference anymore. I ask you, what does God say? He says you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Nothing is impossible with God, nothing. Whatever it may be today, the Lord is here and he's calling you Get up. Get up. He's taken that step towards you. Cross that line so we didn't have to. He is here. Thank you, Jesus.
Father, today we praise you, Father God. We've, we thank you for this word that's upon our hearts. We thank you for the servant who brought forth this word. God, and today we, we pray that the lines that, that stand in front of us, Father God, I pray, Lord, that we can erase them just if they were just made in sand, Lord. Let us just erase them that easily, Father God. The ones that divide this country, that divide the churches, Father God, the ones that divide our own lives. God, I pray that we all can get a little bit dirty, Father God, and go out and do what you have called us to do. God, I thank you right now for what you've done and what you continue to do in our lives, Lord. Lord, I pray right now that the church, not a church, but the church can keep growing. our mission with our brothers and our sisters to grow the kingdom of God. God, and we pray for that to happen. Without those lines of division, but with the love of Jesus Christ in our hearts. We thank you, we praise you, and we give you glory, Lord. So that blessing, holy name, we do pray. And everybody said, amen. 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 Yeah, so we're going to pray over the food before we go. Um, that way we can go ahead and get in there and go ahead and start eating. Because I know everybody's ready for some fried chicken. Amen.